Thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you all and especially with our colleagues from around the world. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about our work here in the U.S. in terms of <coughs> figuring out ways to credential, if you will, or provide academic credit for the free open online courses. And let's see, we can go forward this way. I like the analogy of a landscape for what we're talking about here because landscapes tend to change and evolve over time and we're definitely in that mode. Here you're looking at a map of an area of this state, California, around uh, San Jose, which is south of San Francisco, and this is in the late 1800s, the ranchos of Santa Clara County. And this is what it looks like today. It's now called Silicon Valley, and those ranchos have been replaced by tech companies. And even if you looked really close at this map, I'm sure you would see that many of those tech companies on this map have come and gone. So that's a kind of environment that we're dealing with here when we're talking about these new educational innovations and new technologies. And why is this important? And why is the American Council on Education interested in this? For the benefit of those of you who are watching this video later or for those of you who are not from the US, the American Council on Education is the largest association representing all sectors of higher ed in the U.S. So that's public, private, community college, large research universities, rural, urban, all of them. We have 1,800 members. Um, we are a non-governmental organization. So we're supported by a number of different revenue, revenue streams, memberships, contracts and grants, fee-for-service, and so forth. So we have the ear of the higher education institutions. We have a long-standing practice of helping our institutions look ahead of what is coming down and what they should be aware of. And certainly, the MOOCs and these educational innovations are part of that. But another reason why ACE is interested in this is represented by this number here, the number 30%. This represents, from the uh, 2010 US Census, the percentage of the population in this country aged 25 years and older who have obtained a bachelor's degree or higher, 30%. If we look at younger citizens, so the age group between the age of 25 and 34, and this is from OECD data, the Organization for Economic and um, OE, Economic and Cooperative Development, um, US population 2012, 25 to 34, 43% of our population has a two-year degree or higher. Contrast this with Canada at 57%. Contrast this with South Korea at 65%. So U.S. has a ways to go, and we're worried about that. These are our attainment goals. That is, many organizations in the U.S., Gates Foundation, Gates Foundation Lumina Foundation, many foundations have and government agencies have targeted 60% of our population having at least some post-secondary education by the year 2025. And why do we zero in on that percentage? It's because of this. The Georgetown University Center for Education in the Workforce predicts that by the year 2018, that's only five years from now, 63% of jobs in the U.S will require some level of post-secondary education. So that's a huge gap to fill. And I understand that in other countries there are similar concerns and similar goals and needs. What that means in the US that on an annual basis over the next 15 years, we will need to educate one million more Americans. And that's a big job. And this is in a context where cost and affordability are being highlighted. How can we achieve this? The only way that we can achieve it, I think, is by looking at a whole new paradigm. Now, I show this map. How many of you have seen this image before? Ah, one. Um, Jeff Young talked about Buckminster Fuller yesterday. This is something called the Dymaxion map, and it was developed by Buck Buckminster Fuller in the 1940s and 50s. And what it is is taking the map of the Earth and cutting it up and kind of tilting it in a different direction. And when you look at it, 
all these continents are connected either directly or by short distances via islands and archipelagos and so forth. And I use this image because I think it reflects what we need to do going forward. That is, we're not going to throw out the old. We need to capture the wisdom of the status quo. But what else do we need to do to look at this in a new way so that we can achieve our goals? So some of your other speakers during this conference have talked about some of these issues, and I'll go through them quickly. These are some of the drivers and changes that we're seeing besides the need for attainment and completion, besides dealing with cost and affordability, we're really seeing a shift away from inputs to outcomes. And one of the probably watershed moments came last month or two months ago when the United States Department of Education came out and recommended a purely competency-based direct assessment degree program to be approved for Title IV federal financial aid. Before, these competencies-based programs would have a way to translate competency into credit hour so that their students could access financial aid. Well, now we're making that jump to maybe going strictly to a competency-based program. We can think about having it funded through our traditional mechanisms. That's just one example, but that's a big one. Customization. This image here are Nike shoes that you can go online and make them look however you want. And the personalization and the customization, also the consumerism. These are drivers and trends that I think we need to be aware of in higher education. Of course, when we're talking about an online technology-enhanced environment, one of the great benefits is our ability to customize and personalize the delivery of content and education and exercises and assessments to the particular needs of particular students. And this is important when we're talking about broad assessment where not all students come in with equal levels of, of preparation. Or if you think about it, we all have, we learn in different ways. We have different learning styles. I tend to be a visual learner. I like to see graphs and I like to th see things laid out. Other people learn by doing. Other people learn by hearing. Other people have various sorts of perceptual issues that require them to perceive or uh, receive information in different ways. Well, what if we had systems that really could adapt to our unique needs in order to enhance learning? So that's one positive aspect about the customization. Also, we're talking about new credentials. Now, I believe it's the, the bachelor's degree is really the gold standard and other degree programs for many years to come, but we're also talking about certificates, credentials, we're talking about badges, we're talking about how might these work, and I think that's going to be an important driver and something to consider. And I'm interested in hearing from my colleagues from other countries if this same issue is emerging in your countries as well. How many of you have heard about digital badges and Mozilla? Okay, we can talk about that a little bit later where um, students are earning some form of, form of recognition, but focused on more narrow specializations and competencies rather than whole courses. The unit is a, a competency rather than a course. It's kind of a new way of looking at things. And then, of course, we have the faculty role. This is another photo from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I love this because it's a traditional classroom and the professor has his back turned to the students. How many of you <laughs> were in classes where the professor had his or her back turned to you for most of the class? I think we've talked a lot about the changing faculty role, the disaggregation of the faculty role when it comes to the teaching duties. I mean, it's always been disaggregated in terms of research and then for some heavy duty researchers, management of labs and people and so forth. But in terms of the teaching function, it's been vertically integrated where the faculty member designs the course, sources the content, delivers the course, designs the assessments, and so forth. And now we're seeing that maybe we can do better in terms of student success and learning if we focus our faculty on what they do best and we hire the outsource the best experts for instructional design and assessment and so forth, and we have more of a team effort. That's a big change. But it seems to be a driver and a trend that we're seeing very strongly emerging. And I think that the MOOCs really have fostered this conversation in a deeper way. 
Then, of course, we have open educational resources. Information is out there. Kind of ch relates to the role of the faculty. The faculty and in, in university, instead of being the repository of information of knowledge and the faculty member delivering that knowledge, the faculty member becomes more of the curator of all the knowledge that's out there. Um, I, when I was in LA one summer, I gave myself a project to visit as many museums as I could that I had not visited before. And at the end of the summer, I'd visited 25, all sorts of different, um, different <coughs> sorts of museums. And some are highly curated, where you have experts that select the information, create the experience so that you can capture the best. Others are more like hobbies, and people just throw stuff out there. I, we have two examples here in Pasadena. We have the Norton Simon Museum that's highly curated at someone's collection where he collected the best examples of everything from throughout the course of art history, more or less. And then you have something like, I believe it's a, a, a history museum here in Pasadena that's in an old estate and it has just the belongings of the family thrown in the house, and that's the museum. Well, one is curated, one is not. Well, I think that curation function is highly important, and faculty are the ones who can do that for us. So what are we talking about here? I think what we're talking about is looking at higher education, post-secondary education as more of a system. We talk about the higher education system, but it's not really a system. We don't work together, really at least in, except in certain specific projects. But here you see our traditional degree granting institutions. And we have our different sectors here in this country. Associate degree, that's mostly community colleges and bachelor's degree, graduate degrees. Our continuing education units on many of our institutions are also degree granting. So this is traditional. We, when we talk about higher education, we're really thinking about this. And oftentimes, we're thinking about first-time, full-time residential students when they only represent 15% of the student population in the US. So these degree-granting institutions are all over the map, highly, highly diverse, one of the strengths of higher education in the US. But what else is there? That's only one part of the system. We also have lifelong learning. I put that off to the side. This is what the uh, people in the UK would call leisure learners or hobby learners. And this, interestingly, represents the highest percentage of people accessing MOOCs right now. Leisure hobby learners. Okay, what else do we have? Well, alternative credentials, certificate programs. There's many of our institutions that provide what the Gates Foundation is now calling high quality certificates with labor market value. Now, you probably know that if you sit in a one-day seminar somewhere, you get a piece of paper at the end of that experience, and it's called a certificate, and I guess some people may frame them, but that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about certificate programs. These are bodies of knowledge. They are sequences of courses. They are academic courses. They carry credit, but they are focused more specialized on career or professional areas. And a student can get a standalone certificate, um, but increasingly, we're talking about stacking and modularizing them. So they start with one, and maybe they go on to another more advanced certificate, and maybe those stackable certificates then articulate into a degree. So an individual maybe doesn't start his or her pathway through post-secondary education through the degree route, but rather starts with a certificate, goes to work for a while, another certificate, then makes that commitment to the degree program, but we make it easy for that person to come into the system and, not, and, and, and apply the learning that they have obtained within those certificate programs. Then we have this whole other world. How many of you have heard about prior learning assessment or credit for prior learning? Not too many, and I hadn't heard about it either. So American Council on Education is very active in this area and has been since the, since the 1940s. And what credit for prior learning or prior learning assessment is, is a, a way to grant academic credit for formal learning that did not take place in a college or university. So one standard example that we're all familiar with would be AP exams or CLEP exams. So we give credit to entering freshmen for 
That learning, and they did none of that learning on our campuses. Credit by examination is one form of credit for prior learning that's well accepted. Most institutions accept it. Another form is course reviews, and that's what American Council on Education is doing and has been doing since the 40s. We've been going into um, military settings and assessing the formal education and training in those settings and helping our service members and veterans get credit, academic credit, for that learning when they go into a degree program. So think about someone who's, you know, a navigator on a submarine. They know something about the oceans and currents and um, you look at someone, a lot of the IT and security related professions and training that takes place in the military, medicine, healthcare, you name it. It's probably every discipline is touched on in the military. Well, we have a way to evaluate that and provide academic credit. Similarly, since the 70s, we've been doing that in the corporate and workplace setting. So that's a way to capture formal learning and articulate it into the system. Instead of in a system where we have to educate a lot of people and where we're concerned about costs, can we capture some of that learning? That same Georgetown University Center for Education in the Workplace in another study estimates that on an annual basis in the US, we spend $772 billion annually on post-secondary education and only 35% of that is at colleges and universities. The other 65% is in these extra institutional settings. Now that's a lot of money. A lot of that learning is university level. Does it make sense for us to figure out a way to capture that and help these students? Think about it, a student who's already learned something and then we're going to have them sit in a class and learn it again for credit and pay for it. Does that make sense? Or can we figure out a way, a valid way, that we can capture what they already know? So anyway, MOOCs may fit in here too, if we can figure out a way how to give them academic credit more to follow in that. And then my next um, chart shows where these digital badges may come in. Now they may not, I don't see them necessarily coming in to degree programs right now. Perhaps they're complementary and supplementary to degrees, but I think it's something for us to be aware of if we're looking at a full system of post-secondary education and how we can help people. So that brings us to what I call MOOC mania, which was really the summer of 2012 when our various MOOCs came on the scene. Now, I put a fourth one up there. How many of you are familiar, familiar with FutureLearn? FutureLearn is out of the UK, and this is an offshoot, a separate organization off of Open University. Open University has been doing high quality online degrees for decades, and they do put a lot of thought and analytics behind what they do. I was there a couple weeks ago, and I visited their campus outside of London. FutureLearn hasn't launched yet. It, their first class will launch in October. But they are capturing the assets from Open University, which are significant, along with the British Museum, the BBC, and they are going to be launching something that should be completely different than what we're seeing on the current U.S. MOOCs. So, you know, I, I, I really alert you to what they're going to be doing. So in my uh, consultation discussions with people over in the UK, they make a distinction between what they call C MOOCs or connectivist, connectivist MOOCs. The very first MOOC was delivered in 2008. It was a university, uh, University of Manitoba in Canada. It wasn't in the US. It was really part of the peer connected open educational research, resource movement. So it very much was about peer-to-peer -peer learning, and that's really how MOOC started. The first MOOC was a course that enrolled 20-some-odd people paying students, and it was open and attracted over 2,000. So that was the first. So this movement was just for a couple of years, and then when we get to 2011, 2012, with the growth of the, the um, current MOOCs, platforms that we're talking about, basically the Silicon Valley MOOCs, we make a distinction of something called X MOOCs, 
or, and I don't know why they use X, I think it's because of edX, MITx, Harvard X. Um, I'm just going with their terminology. But basically, these are more directed MOOCs. They're a more traditional model where faculty are designing content. They're delivering it in a format that allows it to be open to lots of people. And they also are delivering it with no admission requirements, no fees. And that's what makes it large in a MOOC. But it's a highly, fairly traditional format in terms of course delivery. And now I'm thinking what is the next stage that I think we're in now. So I'd like your ideas of what we should call it. And I call it maybe HMOOC or hybrid. We're in a hybrid era where we're talking about how do we take bits and pieces of these educational innovations and apply them in different ways. Or maybe we're in a phase that we want to call MOOC 2.0, where it's really the next generation where we're seeing that this evolve. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the issues. I'm going to talk about the credit for MOOCs and what's happening there. And I'm also going to talk about this MOOC 2.0, next generation, and the different ways that institutions are employing them. And we heard a, a very wonderful, detailed talk just now about how one ins fine institution, Georgia Tech, a leader, is employing MOOCs and how they're looking at it. But I'll give you a little broader view of a, a number of different um, types of institutions across the US. So these are the various credentialing models or ways that MOOCs, students who take MOOCs might earn academic credit for them. One is the credit for prior learning that I'll talk about, where I'm Kathy Sandeen, and I took the poetry class on Coursera, and I completed it. It wasn't for credit, but let's say it was. And then I want to apply for an MFA program in creative writing. Can I get credit for that MOOC? Will they count that? Maybe there is a way to do that if I have ACE credit recommendations or something like that. We're seeing some institutions do formal articulations where they agree Yes, for these MOOC courses, we will formally accept those into certain degree programs. And articulations have occurred for quite some time. So this is not an uncommon pathway or practice for institutions. Content licensing is one way that we're taking the content from MOOCs and embedding it into a credit-bearing course. And then there may be reciprocal arrangements where this institution has this MOOC, I'll accept your MOOC if you accept my MOOC, that sort of thing. Um, current implementations, you've heard about some of these, you've probably read about some of these. Um, edX gives credit if, if for um, uh, students who take the final examination physically at a Pearson testing center. Udacity and San Jose State have that partnership. Antioch University is one of the first to do content licensing of Coursera courses. And we just had the announcement of the Coursera state system licensing initiative here in the US. And then there are ACE credit recommendations. That's another method, a way of credentialing or offering credit for MOOCs. Now I mentioned that ACE credit recommendation service has been around for a long time. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the components that go into that. Um, this is what we look at. We have a process that's been in place. The process is based largely on the course approval process that universities use to approve their own new courses. So look very carefully at curriculum, what is being taught, the stated student learning outcomes that we're trying to achieve in that particular course or activity, looking at the breadth and difficulty of course, because we assign credit recommendations at four different levels, graduate, upper division, lower division, and vocational, which is not credit level or college level. So the breadth and difficulty of the course is, of course, very important. We look at the assessment, how are students assessed for their learning in the course. And when it comes to online programs, um, we're looking at how do students engage or interact with the system or with the faculty member or with other students. And when we're looking at online courses, we're also concerned about authenticating the identity of the student. We want to make sure that the student who enrolled in the course is the student completing and submitting the work and completing the summative assessments. And then finally, proctoring that on that summative final exam, that there's a way to prevent academic dishonesty. 
And there's really two methods for doing that right now, and I think we'll see more uh, innovation. One is a physical testing center, where a student pays a fee and goes to Pearson Testing Center, or they may go to a university or a public library that has a setup to do that. And they pay a fee, and they're witnessed while they're taking that examination. Um, their identity is also uh, authenticated. In addition, there's um, emerging technology in webcam proctoring, where a student takes the examination on their computer while they're being watched by someone over the webcam while they're taking that examination. And that is the uh, pro proctoring technology that Coursera is using presently. Another important thing about ACE is we use a pool of faculty reviewers who conduct these reviews. And it's always more than one reviewer, so it's two or three faculty members from dis different institutions who have content expertise and teaching expertise that are reviewed, reviewing these courses. And then finally, we have a standard process that we use. It's not something that we made up. So this has been going on for some time. And the question was, when students started completing MOOCs and they're asking how might we get credit, we asked ourselves the question at ACE, could we take this long-standing process that's been accepted and apply it to the MOOC world? Um, we do have a network of 2,000 institutions that have the practice of considering and accepting ACE credit recommendations. When a, when a credit re recommendation is, is um, established, a student can, who completes the course can then apply for a transcript that has the recommendation on it, and they can take that with them and petition to have it apply for credit toward a degree. So that's how it works. Again, going over the quality implied in this process, experienced faculty reviewers with the proper expertise, they review both, both place-based, classroom-based courses as well as online, and we do quite a few Bit, uh, quite a few reviews annually, and so have a great deal of experience. Also, we apply consistent standards that are relevant to higher education, national standards, so the reviewers don't go in and say, well, this would be the equivalent to this at my institution. It's more of a national standard. And then we publish our recommendations and stand behind them. In terms of quality for online programs, there's a couple other longstanding programs. Sloan C has five pillars for quality in online education. Sloan C was the first professional uh, organization supporting online education. They've been around since 1993. Another one is Quality Matters. They um, have benchmarks for quality, benchmarking for quality online. So if you're interested in quality issues and quality controls, these are some of the places that you might want to look. So, ACE received a grant from the Gates Foundation to conduct a number of research studies, and one component of it was the relevance and applicability of our course review and course rec credit recommendation service to the MOOC world, and we did some pilots. We looked at five classes on Coursera, and these are the courses in, that in February of this year <coughs> received credit recommendations. Um, the one on the bottom I've highlighted is algebra, that received a vocational credit recommendation. It's not a college or university level course. But a lot of students, as you know, from first generation low income um, segments, this is a course that gives them problems and it, they need to have in order to be successful in many degree programs. We also completed um, our pilot at Udacity, and these are the courses that received credit recommendations at, at Udacity. I think it's interesting that these are kind of lower level, um, lower division, oftentimes preparatory type courses, and I think the idea is that students, high school students or maybe community college students, students considering coming back to higher education after a break could complete these courses on their own earn a credit recommendation that might speed them along their way. Um, there's another form of prior learning assessment called portfolio review that creates an electronic portfolio of various experiences and activities. And the organization that is the leader in that, CALE, the Center for a, uh, Adult and Experiential Education, has done studies that students coming in, especially non-traditional students, older students, who have some credit, some kind of confidence 
tend to persist and complete. So students who have done this for credit and are allowed to use that credit are probably highly motivated students who will be successful. So of course there's challenges for us with this. The Credit Recommendation Service has been, been a little bit in the shadows at ACE, and now in the MOOC world it's getting more attention. So we need to do more work around general awareness and institutional acceptance, working with faculty who to understand what this is. We want to develop more specific credit pathways. So for a student who completes this level of uh, corporate training at this university or at this corporation, will automatically articulate or trans have a pathway into a degree program. Um, other issues and challenges um, are listed there. Uh, we also have a pilot that we're tracking students with credit for MOOC. So these are institutions who, in our research component of this Gates grant, have agreed to accept credit for MOOCs. And they are going to allow us to track students who bring that credit with them. So we can test the idea, the hypothesis, that a student that comes in with some form of credit is more likely to persist. Or wouldn't it be interesting to see a student who took introduction, introduction to physics with a MOOC, how do they do in that second level physics course compared to native students who've taken them both in the classroom? So they, we're starting in the exploratory stages to try to look under the hood at MOOCs and the learning and how might these work and help our institutions. So in terms of integration, how different institutions are integrating MOOCs, there's a lot of different ways, and we'll briefly go through these. They're using the MOOCs as an LMS platform to post their own courses for the world or for their own students. Their content licensing, what I like to talk, say, call the textbook of the future. This is content they're pulling down from various MOOCs. Some are free, open resources. Some they have to pay a license fee in order to access, and that becomes part of their courses. I think the idea of preparatory coursework for underprepared students or tutoring is very promising. Of course, the learning analytics will feed into this in terms of helping um, uh, personalize, customize the learning for specific student needs. And then professional development of faculty. You're teaching a new course. Maybe you're going to go out and you're going to listen to some lectures yourself in order to come up to speed. or learning more about the student analytics behind the course that you're teaching will help you adapt and refine your course. Other ways, credit for prior learning, we've talked about University of Edinburgh, which was one of the early international universities on the Cor Coursera platform, sees their MOOC initiative as an incubator to try new ideas that they will import into their online programs or classroom-based programs. So they see it as they're paying money, but they see it the, the best investment as benefiting their institution in that way. I learned about something uh, Daphne Kohler and I participated on a webinar earlier this week, and she talked about the distributed flip. Have any of you heard about that? Distributed flip, okay, good. Um, flipped classroom, of course we know what the flipped classroom is. The distributed flip is you have multiple faculty around the world who are teaching the same course in a flipped format. The most difficult part of teaching in a flipped format is coming up with those in-classroom based exercises. What if you had a community where different faculty shared their ideas for those different classroom based activities for the flipped format? I thought that was an interesting concept. Internationalization, we've touched on that in other lectures. I think it's a, there's different ways and we might be able to take better advantage of that. Um, of course, recruitment, student recruitment and institutional reputation, using MOOCs as a loss leader. That's kind of a US term where you sell something, an initial product of, at a loss, or you give it away for free in hopes that people then pay later for what you're offering. And I think we're seeing that as part of the MOOC movement. So again, where we're heading for is a well-oiled and integrated system where we can capture all these different forms of post-secondary education to help students make their way in and through post-secondary education. And where will the future lead? Um, I don't know. But I think it's great that we have groups like this that get together to really have these deep conversations to share where we are and to try to see where we might go. So thank you. I'm ready for questions.
Um, I'm Ui from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandin, for such an informative presentation. And my question is, um, while I'm certain that MOOC is um, one form of education to go, to reach out to the world, and my question, as I mentioned earlier, is um, how do you then teach emotional intelligence, uh, mold the characters and uh, you know, leadership among the students, especially in uh, undergraduate programs, because um, I, I I can see that Master of Science in Computer Engineering, as what Professor Brass mentioned, is fully online, and my friends always um, joke about it. Well, computer engineers only work with computer. You do not need emotional intelligence. Computer won't talk back. You know, so <laughs> so I can understand that, but. I think in education, one part of the important um, education that has to do with emotional intelligence, more the characters of students while they are growing throughout these four years or five years in the colleges, and also more their character and work in team. You know? so, so is there any way that MOOC can actually achieve that? I do understand that now we have webinar, we have video conferencing, we have software that can do face recognition, People can sit around all corners of the world, um, discuss, you know, um, current issues and so on. I, I, is that part of the development in the MOOC as well? I mean, may I have your comment on this? Thank you. Thank you for that. And you bring up something that is a big concern for many of us. Um, you're absolutely correct. What we hear in the U.S. from employers all the time is that they are not seeing in our graduates the skills that they really desire. And when you drill down and ask them what are those skills, they're really talking about exactly what you're mentioning. So critical thinking, communication skills, um, teamwork, economic, social, cultural, global awareness and competence, all of those things, you know, analytical abilities in a broad sense, in fact, in this country, we have something called the job paradox, where we have high unemployment, 9% nationally, and there are over a million open positions that aren't being filled because employers are saying, I'm just not finding the right candidate. And we in the U.S. call these, this range of skills the liberal arts skills. And you know we have a history in a sector of liberal arts colleges that aren't you know, STEM aren't focused on a profession, but are focused on fostering the mind and thinking and, and these skills. And even in my poetry class that I took on Coursera, but granted, I'm a, I know how to learn. You know, I, I, I know how to be a student. I had never taken poetry before, and when I took it, we're doing close readings of poems, and I realized about halfway through that that's a form of problem solving. When you're reading a text, whether it's literature, history, law, or a poem, a contemporary poem that can be very, very challenging, you're trying to make connections and you're building those circuits in your brain for that critical thinking and problem solving. I think we kind of discount that education and I'm very concerned that if we're going to solve our attainment problems by going completely to online, that we're going to have a two-tiered system where some students are gonna get specialized and broad skills. You've heard about the T-shaped individual, you know, broad skills and then specialized skills. Maybe some only get the specialized, they're vocationalists. Um, that would be a, tr a, a tragedy. So we have to figure it out and I'm not sure, like for, for me, I was working on problem solving skills on a MOOC, but again, I'm a student who knows how to learn. What about someone who is just starting out, a young student? the chances of that maybe aren't as great. So I think what we're looking at is really this MOOC 2.0 hybrid, where we're using a combination of online and technology enhanced education where it makes sense, and that we're all combining that where, with in-person experiences. And maybe the in-person experiences really emphasize exactly what you're saying. I think we can, you know, we work in distributed teams. I think we can do teamwork and we can do, um, we can enhance global competence and awareness through these great new innovations, but we can't forget 
that part of education. And I don't, maybe, the great thing about MOOCs is the acceleration of innovation. And maybe we'll be able to come up with ways where we can address those uh, important skills. But right now, I think we're talking about a hybrid, a hybrid format. Other questions? So you talked about distributed play uh, as well as, you know, like MOOC 2.0. So can I think of MOOC 3.0 or 2.0 to 3.0? Say that, you know, there are several platforms available. There are several universities giving their courses. Let's say I can think of a particular course A, which is, let's say from Stanford, is, in my opinion, is the best one. I take it from there. Next course, I take it from Georgia Tech. Course C, I take it from IIT Bombay because that's my, the best one. Now, as a student, I take it from different one. Can I go to a third or fourth university saying, can you now give me a degree? Here is a graduation fee. Give me the degree. Is that possible? Right now, it is not possible. And I find it unlikely that institutions, I'm not aware of any, would accept all credits from another institution toward a degree. Right now, we have a practice of a residency, residency requirement. So even if you're transferring in from a community college two years out of a four-year degree, there's still some residency uh, uh, required. And residency could mean an online program, but it's all online courses at that institution. We do have a segment in the US, however, of institutions that we call adult serving institutions. And you might want to look at some of these. Um, Excelsior College in New York, Thomas Edison State College in New Jersey, Charter Oak College in Connecticut, where for years since the 70s, they've been really aggregators, where they will accept a large amount of credit for prior learning in the form of examinations and these other. So you may not be able to patch together a whole degree and get a degree from them, but they probably, if they follow their current practice, a substantial amount of the degree might be accepted via that way. But then there's another pathway, you know? What if employers, these are validated credit from these institutions either signature track with identity verified or ACE credit, but it's also proctored or other methods, would an employer accept that on a resume and say, okay, in my view, this is as good as a degree to me, or the whole idea of where do the badges fit in. Now, we know that some of the students that um, completed the early MOOCs, like artificial intelligence, they got a badge, they posted it on their LinkedIn profile, employers, recruiters were scanning those, looking for candidates for particular positions. And there's a shortage of coders in Silicon Valley. I mean, it, high, high demand. So they're hiring people based on the fact that they finished this course and they have a badge on their LinkedIn profile. So we're, it's not completely shifting away from degrees, but we're seeing some openness to different forms of credentialing. Maybe I'll be stating the obvious, but uh, I think some of what you're hearing is we do not here represent the majority of people and students that seek education. We're really just a, a, a very small group. Um, and that small group, in my opinion, will continue doing what we do. Yes. And we do very well. Uh, and that residential education is irreplaceable, in my opinion. Uh, so, but that's not the whole issue. The other thing I would urge all of us to think is this type of disruptive approaches do not have to fit a single model or dimension. Uh, I suspect that we're going to find a myriad of uses. We are going to use it the way we think for our clientele is best, and others are going to use it differently. Th at the end of the game is, does everybody gain? Does everybody improve? Uh, and that's what we, we should be looking at carefully. I, I completely agree with you. I think a lot of the early comments about MOOCs was doom and gloom. You know, either this is going to save us, or this is going to destroy higher education as we know it. I think we all realize now it's not an either or, it's a both and. And 
I speak a lot, I get invited to speak a lot to boards of trustees, especially at smaller, um, but, but well-renowned liberal arts institutions, colleges that are trying to figure this out. What should they be doing? And I think no one's saying that you need to disrupt your high-touch residential experience. Keep that. Yeah, maybe some technology will enhance student learning and the student experience, that's fine. But what if you were able to figure out a way to serve more students from the non-traditional sector with your high quality programs through some of these other means? Can it be a both and together rather than an either or? And when I look at the big picture of we need globally more people educated, um, we need to think about this. And it doesn't mean that we're going to destroy what's good. Remember that map, the Buck Buckminster Fuller map? The wisdom of the status quo but change for the future as well. We can do it. We're the smartest people around. We can figure this out, I think, and I hope. And there's my email if, if you want to contact me for more, more discussion and comment. Uh, thank you. I just want to bring us back many, many years ago, if I can recall University of London offering overseas law degree. Now, my view is MOOCs market today is very different from then. The world right now is so small, we are globalized, and MOOC is made possible because of technology. So I think if we go back those years that were even online courses, the market is very focused. Mm -hmm. University of London operate in certain country. So to put people together, even for face to face, there's already that difficulty that then to fly people in and just to have a face-to-face -face is going to be difficult. So I, I think MOOCs itself, in and of itself, is not to serve uh, courses whereby you must have face-to-face. -face. So there's a different market segment altogether in a very connected, small, globalized world because of technology. I, I think that's true, and I think um, the fully online programs work at the graduate level, the master's level, where you have people who know how to learn and that sort of thing. And I will, I'll end with an anecdote from my poetry class. And by the way, I'm a slacker on my current class. It started this week. I'm taking an art class from Penn State, which is a combination of lecture plus practice. So I'm gonna have to do some art and then digitize it. But anyway, the poetry class I did, I did complete, and that was in the fall of 2012, and it was during the election in the US, right? So I had to remember, when I posted a comment, there's something in a poem that was part of an argument that one side was making. I mean, it was a marginalization of, you know, poor people and, you know, talked about in the poem. So, and I was drawing a um, connection to the, the election and some of the comments in the U.S. But I had to remember that it wasn't only a U.S. audience listening to my comments, so I had to frame it and explain the context and then make my comment. That's a good thing that I was thinking that this, I'm in a global, I'm a global citizen. So I think in a lot of ways MOOCs can, can enhance some of this to the person who is sensitive, aware, and willing to learn. So I agree with you, it is a, a much smaller global world. Thank goodness.